The gospel teaches us that Jesus is the one who actually makes others righteous through his death. And by the gift of his Holy Spirit, he helps his righteous people, his people made righteous, to grow in righteous living. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And Jonathan, as we begin our message, Waiting for the Lord, you used a Bible word a few times right there. Want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. When you talk about righteous or righteousness, what are we talking about? Well, the person who is righteous in Scripture is fundamentally one who is right with God who has right standing before God, and then having that right standing learns to behave righteously, that is, in in the right kind of way, in a way that's pleasing to God. And we need to understand that righteousness is only available to us as we trust in Jesus, as he takes away our sin, our guilt before God, and gives us, as a gift, his perfect standing. And that's the gift of righteousness. And sometimes in the Old Testament, you know, we'll, we'll see that the, the righteous are contrasted with the wicked. And we're going to see that actually in the psalm we're going to be looking at today. Uh, but, but that really means the, the people who are right with God and the people who belong to him. And as we read the whole of Scripture, the whole Bible, we understand that being in the right with God is only possible in Christ. So that's what we're thinking about. It's a, it's a gospel reality to be a righteous person. Well, we look at that today, as you just heard, in the book of Psalms. We're actually in Psalm 37. So if you have a Bible handy, join us there as we begin our message, Waiting for the Lord. Here is Jonathan. I wonder if you ever look out on the injustice of this world, on the wickedness that takes place, on the prosperity and success of unscrupulous people, on the wrongs perhaps that have been done to you personally. I wonder if you ever look out on all this and feel vexed, frustrated, aggrieved, or angry. I guess we all know something of that sense of vexation. We see bad people doing bad things and not only getting away with those things, but prospering and flourishing as they do so. And if we're honest, when we observe all that, it gets to us and it troubles us, at least some of the time. Well, this issue, this feeling, it's nothing new, of course. King David knew it well in his day. It's what prompted him to write this psalm. And he has this to say about it, verse 1, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Now, it's easy enough, of course, to say, oh, well, you know, don't fret. It's easy enough to hear the admonition, don't fret yourself about all this. But, of course, it is rather harder to heed that advice if you are currently facing fretful circumstances, if you are under pressure or facing difficulty because of the apparent triumph of the wicked over the good. As we enter into this psalm and begin to consider the issue it addresses, I think we see how timely and how relevant it is for us. I think we all sense that we need to learn the lessons it would teach us. We can see, even here at the outset of the psalm, how liberating it would be to free ourselves from fretting and from vexation and even from envying the wicked in their success and prosperity. 
So to learn the lessons that the Lord would teach us here through David, we need to walk through this psalm together and enter into its rhythm and enter into its cadence. But as we do that, we should just recognize together something of the nature of this particular psalm, something of the way in which it was composed and put together. We are, of course, dealing with poetry here. We know that. That's obvious enough. But in the original language, in the Hebrew in which this psalm was written, it was composed as a particular type of poem. It's actually composed as an acrostic poem where each new thought, each new stanza begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We we lose that in the English, of course. You can't preserve that. We don't see it. But it is a sign to us that the structure and the flow of this psalm are poetic in nature. The psalm, it is shaped by art and by beauty as well as by content. Now, The reason I mention all that is to emphasize the fact that we should actually read this psalm like a poem. We don't read the psalm like we would read a New Testament letter and expect, you know, point A to be followed by point C and then to be followed by point C with a kind of linear logic of an Apostle Paul. No, in poetry, themes come in waves and they come in cycles. They they get mentioned, they get explored for a little bit, they get set aside, and, and then they get returned to a little bit later. And so as we immerse ourselves in this beautiful psalm, we won't try and go verse by verse and follow a linear structure from beginning to end, but we're going to just stand back a little and draw out some of the repeated themes from the whole psalm. So then, how does David, the psalmist, help us to avoid fretting ourselves because of evildoers? How does he help us navigate and address the pressing issue that he raises for us? Well, he helps us by profiling for us two types of people, two types of future, and two types of response. And in outlining things this way, I'll say I was greatly helped by my friend Christopher Ash, who is uh, producing some wonderful work, some wonderful books on the Psalms just at the moment. But, but two people, two futures, two responses. We, we begin with two types of people. David wants to show us and highlight for us that there is all the difference in the world between the evildoers and the righteous, between the wicked and the meek. There's something puzzling, isn't there, about the wicked person who enjoys so much success and prosperity and outward happiness in this world. We, we see it, don't we? from time to time, the evil ruler, the dictator who enjoys wealth and privilege and a life of luxury even as he oppresses his people actively and all the time. History has provided us with ample examples of that profile of person. We see them enough in the world today if we look around. Or we think of the unscrupulous business owner who is his hard on his employees, dishonest with his customers, brutal with the competition, but who builds great wealth and a sprawling commercial empire. We think of the celebrity, don't we, whose personal life is a, a mess, substance abuse maybe, pride, arrogance, sense of entitlement, but whose fame and success and wealth only grow day by day. We, we know the stories. We know names perhaps from our own experience, names from the newspaper. They come to mind maybe even as we consider the profile. And here in the psalm, David acknowledges the fact that we might well be envious of the wicked, of those whose lives are actually marked by wrongdoing. There is something enviable about their material prosperity, their personal success. They prosper in their way, verse 7. And they have abundance, verse 16. So often abundance that comes through dishonest dealing and off the backs of others, verse 21. The wicked borrows, but but he doesn't pay back. Their word is not their bond. They don't feel any particular obligation to repay what had been lent to them in kindness. They're out for themselves, and they're not concerned for the consequences or the impact on others. 
there will be a type of wicked person, verse 12, who plots against the righteous, who not only conducts his or her own affairs in a wicked way, but is actually overtly hostile toward those who do good. The wicked, verse 32, watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. Bizarrely, things seem to go pretty well for such people. More often than we might expect, verse 35, I've seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, beautiful home, beautiful family, wealth, success, health, all the rest, yet a life that is absolutely rotten to the core. That's the wicked. That's one type of person that David profiles for us, and it's, I guess, familiar enough. But now we turn to the other type of person he has in mind, the righteous person, the meek person, and such a person could not be more different. The contrast, it couldn't be more stark. that probably is familiar enough for all of us. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Waiting for the Lord. We'll get back to this message in just a moment, so I hope you'll stay with us. Hey, if you've never been to the website, I hope you'll come check that out. At the website, you're going to find links there to our weekly e-devotional. You can subscribe to our newsletter, find connection to social media, and to things like YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, I hope that you'll go and like and subscribe our YouTube channel. By doing that, We'll update you whenever we post some new content from Jonathan. And not only can you uh, listen to his teaching there, but a great way to watch as well. So again, if you're on YouTube, like and subscribe to the Encounter the Truth YouTube channel. Our website, by the way, where you're going to find all these links is EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. If you joined us late, we're in Psalm 37. Let's get back to the message. Here is Jonathan. That's the wicked. That's one type of person that David profiles for us, and it's, I guess, familiar enough. But now we turn to the other type of person he has in mind, the righteous person, the meek person, and such a person could not be more different. The contrast, it couldn't be more stark. Now, when we hear about the righteous person here in the psalm, we have to think a little bit carefully about what that actually means. If we know the wider teaching of the Bible, we know that no one in this world is actually truly righteous in and of themselves, save for God himself. We're all compromised. (laughs) We're all sinful But Bible passages like this will nonetheless talk about the righteous person. We we want to identify with the righteous person here. Of course we do. We want to be on the side of light and not on the side of darkness. But we know that we're not perfectly righteous or blameless in terms of our own behavior. And, you know, in that sense, as we, as we feel that tension, and I think we do as we read the psalm, in that sense, the psalm actually draws our eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important for us just to pause here and to consider this for a moment. As I said when we looked at a previous psalm, these, these kingly psalms spoken by King David, they all point us in a way to the greater king, to the righteous king, to the coming king, even to Jesus Christ himself. And when we think about that, that makes a great deal of sense. Jesus is supremely the righteous man. He is supremely the righteous sufferer as well. We can read this psalm and actually apply the profile of the righteous and meek man to the Lord Jesus perfectly and without missing a beat. All that is said of such a person here is true of Jesus in a supreme way. He lived the life of perfect goodness, didn't he? He faced the opposition of the wicked, not least at the cross. And he experienced the salvation and the vindication of the Father in the resurrection and in the ascension on high. This is the story of Jesus in a very special way. But you know, that's not where the significance of the psalm stops. The gospel teaches us that Jesus is the one who actually makes others righteous through his death. At the cross of Calvary, he takes away the sin 
of the people, and he makes his people right before God the judge. And by the gift of his Holy Spirit, he helps his righteous people, his people made righteous, to grow in righteous living, to begin to behave in a righteous way. So as we look at the profile of the righteous person here, we're right to think of the Lord Jesus himself, and we're right to think of the people he makes righteous through his work at Calvary, the people he helps to grow in practical righteousness by his spirit. In fact, in verse 28, David actually calls these righteous people God's saints, his holy people. And you know, if you and I belong to Jesus today, that's, that's us. We're included. So the people of God are the righteous ones, made righteous by the blood of Jesus, growing in practical righteousness by the spirit of Jesus. And so what does such a person look like? Well, it may be that in the present time, the righteous actually don't look all that remarkable in the eyes of the world. You know, the people of God are not often the rich of this world, the outwardly impressive, the prosperous and successful. Verse 16, better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of the wicked. The righteous don't live to feather their own nest, to serve their own comfort, and Jesus taught us that by his example. He was the carpenter of Nazareth who had nowhere to lay his own head. But even so, despite the possible limitations of resources, the righteous know something about generosity. Verse 21, the wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I've certainly seen that. The people of God are not always rich in material terms, but nonetheless, the people of God are so often marked by astounding generosity. And sometimes the least wealthy of God's people can be the most lavishly generous. And within all of that, the people of God, the righteous people, see the Lord's faithfulness. Verse 25, I've been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Isn't that a wonderful observation on life? He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Not only is the righteous person marked by a generosity of hand, but also by a wisdom of speech, verse 30. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. The law of God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The righteous helps others not just by meeting practical needs, but also by speaking life-giving truth from the Word of God. And of course, all this, it's the Lord Jesus in his perfection, isn't it? He is the very wisdom of God who came down from heaven. But the people of God are like this too. Godly saints know God's word and have it in their hearts. And God's people know truth and speak truth and can walk through life with a steadiness of step because of that. It's lovely just to stand back and observe all the words and, and terms used to describe this godly person throughout the psalm. Just notice all these descriptors with me. The righteous person is meek, verse 11, not asserting herself or seeking his own advantage. Such people are blameless, verse 18. You know, you can't throw mud at them and have it stick. The righteous are, are saints, verse 28. Those who have been made holy, we know through the blood of Jesus. Such a person is, verse 37, blameless and upright, a man of peace. Rather than stirring conflict and picking fights in a world of conflict, God's people are going to be peacemakers. The two profiles that David sets before us here in the psalm, they, they couldn't be more different. They are actually diametrically opposed to one another. And I don't think there's actually anything too surprising within them. We know the profile of the wicked. We've seen enough versions of that type. But for the grace of God, we'd all be like that ourselves. We know something of the profile of the righteous as well. As Christian believers, we know that this is what we're called to be like. But now here's the issue. <laughs> And I think it's the real heart issue of the psalm. Are there not days when we wonder whether it is actually 
worth being on the side of light rather than darkness? Are there not days when we wonder whether it would not just be easier and a bit more rewarding and a bit more satisfying just to live as the wicked live? The wicked give the righteous a hard time, and they seem often to flourish as they do so. The wicked seem to have more material wealth, more success, more acclaim, more worldly happiness in some ways sometimes. And so we ask ourselves perhaps, even if very, very quietly and very, very discreetly, we ask ourselves, what's the point? I mean, what is the point? If you're not a Christian believer and you wonder if all this is actually for you, it's, it's actually a reasonable question on one level, but it is a vitally important one. Why buy in to all this when living the world's way is easier and seemingly more rewarding much of the time? A question, you see, it's relevant to all of us. And David anticipates it in the next contrast that he draws for us. If there are two types of people in this psalm, there are also two very distinct futures. The righteous and the wicked can anticipate two very different outcomes to their lives. Notice again how the psalm opens. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. The other day I was, I was studying in preparation for this sermon. I was in my study and I, I glanced out the window and as I did so, I caught sight of our lawn, which has not had a great summer, all things considered. I was actually aggrieved at the sight of the crab grass that was beginning to take over the patch outside the window. The heat of the summer had taken a toll on the grass, as it often does. The crabgrass had made the most of the opportunity to move in. As I sat there, I began to strategize, root out the crabgrass, irrigate the soil, reseed with proper grass. And then a comforting thought occurred to me. Crabgrass is, I understand, an annual weed. It will die over the winter, and there will be a fresh start in the spring. The crabgrass, it is dominant now. There's no question about that. You come around, you'll see it. But it's not going to have the final word. As we look out on the injustices of this present world, and we are tempted to vexation or despair, David draws our eyes to the further horizon of God's future. And he reminds us that how things appear now, the present order of things, it is not how they will be ultimately in the future. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, really taking a look at these two different types of people, the evildoers and the wicked, the righteous and the meek. And we're going to continue this message on our next broadcast. Hope you make it a point to tune in. If you ever miss a program, listen online at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth does depend on your generosity to keep this program on this station. So thank you for giving to and supporting this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Worthy, Living in Light of the Gospel. And Jonathan, I understand you appreciate this book so much, you've actually used this in your home church. Yeah, we've just finished working through this book as an elder study for our, our leaders within the church, and we found it to be so rich and helpful. It was just good for our, our hearts and for our personal discipleship, because the call of this book is to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And if we know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we want to do that, and we need to be encouraged and helped and reminded to do that all the time. And this rich but very accessible and pretty brief study is a tremendous encouragement in doing that very thing. We were helped by it, and we were grateful for it ourselves. Well, we'd love to send you a copy of this book, Worthy, Living in Light of the Gospel, is our way of saying thank you for your financial support. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or over the phone when you call 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Or again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org. 
You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, 2KE081. Or in the U.S. at Encounter the Truth, 215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.